because that strong sense of self of self importance is is a very fragile thing. It's a target for all sort of things that are in contradiction with its aims. And on top of that, therefore, that vulnerability also gives rise to a state of insecurity, of fear. And then that in turn leads to a lack of readiness to be open and concerned by others because we are over by oneself. So in fact, uh, being over concerned by the, the, the having a strong and a successful triumphant self is a sort of recipe for torment and is like a magnet which attracts all kinds of troubles or like an arrow, a, a, a target that is just wide open to all the arrows again of uh, you know, success and failure, praise and blame, and uh, the overly, being overly concerned by fame or anonym, anonymity, all those worldly preoccupations that sort of keeps us always in that uh, alternance between hope and fear, between attraction and aversion, and basically that leaves us in a very uh, a state that lacks peace, serenity, inner strength, and some sense of confidence that we can deal with whatever comes one's way. And also when it comes to help others, we're more like a, a beggar that wishes to give a banquet to uh, hundreds of his friends. You know, basically, it's not much to give, even that good attention may come from time to time. Or we are like a prisoner that say, oh, may I free everyone from this jail? You know, he's such in a situation himself or herself, not much he can do even for himself. So therefore comes the idea, well, in order to achieve that, I need to uh, develop a certain number of quality, the capacity to do so. And that doesn't just come out of nowhere. You know, how could I do so that my mind will suddenly be pervaded with a very strong and stable uh, state of altruism that maintain itself no matter what's happening, no matter the way people treat me, because the goal of altruism is not just to get some kind of praise or reward or you know, people appreciate what you do. The goal, often people complain you know, when they help others, they say, oh look, you know, I help in this person, but it's not so nice, this and that, so I thought of wasting my time and it's, we get burned out. It does happen when we accompany people who are facing difficulties, whether in their lives, in their health. So because of the burden of these difficulties, sometimes they are not particularly pleasant. But if you, if you go, when you come to assist them, is to help. Well, that's, that's the point, not that they are, sort of be, they are going to be nice with you. Your fulfillment comes from, okay, I'm going to spend these few hours or these few days to serve that person who is not well or maybe who is dying. And that's my goal, to make it everything possible so that these few moments will be a little bit more peaceful, a little bit more comforting, a little bit more comfortable, whatever that person needs, even if it doesn't look very reasonable. Or but My point is to be there, I'm there for that. So there's even that person Sometimes they are wonderfully nice and peaceful too, sometimes not, but that's not the problem. So this idea that we can only give love and compassion to those who treat us back in a good way, that doesn't work. I mean, that's not the point of compassion. Compassion is the wish that may, I, may all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. The causes of suffering that goes very deep that goes to the root ignorance of a misconstruing reality, taking this for permanent, what is impermanent, believing that there's a strong core autonomous self when there is just a, a, a stream of consciousness that is constantly changing, and believing that 
outer objects do have intrinsic qualities such as beautiful, ugly, attractive, repulsive, and so forth, while it's just an interaction with our perceptions and this superimposition from our mind. All kind of distortions of reality that ends up in frustration. So that's ignorance. That's what the root cause of suffering. And then the cause of suffering also are all the mental toxins that uh, destroy our happiness and consequently that of others, like hatred, arrogance, obsessive desire, nagging jealousy that wreak havoc in our mind and cause us to act and speak in ways that are detrimental to others' happiness. And loving kindness is just not to like someone. Very often people say, how can you apply compassion and loving kindness to a dictator? Someone who with great hate and cruelty has inflicted unthinkable suffering on others. Even I read the words of a, of a very good French philosopher who is a very intelligent person, and he said, there is a limit. It's too much asking to feel loving kindness or altruistic love and compassion for, for an, a, a dictator or a psychopath murderer. But here, I think it's a, it's a misconception of what compassion and loving kindness means. It, it doesn't mean that you like that person. That's not the point. It means that compassion and loving kindness, here in that case, of those we ordinarily perceive as enemies, is that what we wish is made the root cause of the suffering they are inflicting on others, and eventually their own suffering that will come from that, may that cause disappear. So it's not the wish may that dictator be successful, or that everything is fine with him, you know, after he has done all that, maybe have a good holiday on some tropical island and have a good time. <laughs> I wish him good. Go on. Continue. It's just may the hatred that has made it to be such a harmful being, may that disappear from that person's mind. If that is loving kindness and compassion, of course, you should actually grow that loving kindness and compassion 10 times more than almost anyone else because that will fulfill a, question, a much greater need. So that, and, and I see that also, how we need to develop that attitude and that genuine altruistic love and compassion. For instance, I among the different humanitarian projects that we are doing, we have a, a mobile clinic in Bodhgaya. Bodhgaya is the place where the Buddha achieved enlightenment 2,500 years ago. And it's like, almost like a hanging garden of peace in, in an area of India that is probably the, the most difficult part of India. Extreme poverty, there's been a, a government that was so unbelievably corrupt, and landlords come with guns to, to evict uh, poor peasants from their lands. And when there's an election, we have to hide the cars because all the, the different parties come and take your cars away to go around and, and do their campaign. So it's almost lawless state. But Bongaya is this sort of island of peace where, where Buddha achieved enlightenment. And so around that, there's unbelievably neglected villages. When we were building a small monastery there, we went to visit a stone sort of carving uh, sort of community. And they had come from a distant province of Rajasthan a century ago. And because of caste system, they are not allowed to move out of that sort of small valley or something. So they're just there. They have don't, don't, hardly any access to education, to health. It's, it's a terrible. And the, there's fluoride in the water. So they all get deformed when they are 35 years old. It's unbelievable. So we try to help them. But since nobody ever helps them, as some people come sometimes because they got some money from government and they pretend to come and then give a few things and then go away with the money. So then when someone helps them, they think, oh, this guy is getting you know, a lot and he's giving us a few peanuts to show off. 